let you go through it. And I hope I can do this without making a lot of trouble. Okay. I think it's good to make good trouble for the accused. <laughs> I, I, this is the first time I'm I'm using this program like this. Okay. All right. So we begin. Slide one. Our story. Her story. History. Slide two. Where does our story begin? Slide three. Our story begins in our imagination. In the scientific imagination or in the religious imagination. Slide 4. The scientific imagination. There is only one notion that scientists have concerning our ancestry. It is not a proven fact. According to the tale, human beings evolved. Although scientists claim that anatomically modern Homo sapiens developed, they are unable to identify our ancestors. As a result, all that scientists have is theories, hypotheses, or educated guesses that need a lot of supporting data to be proven correct. In other words, scientists are unable to identify a direct ancestor of humans. There is currently no solid, widely acknowledged proof of a single direct progenitor of Homo sapiens. It is a puzzle. In an evolutionary tree, Homo sapiens is closely related to other hominin species, but the identity of a single direct progenitor is still unknown. Why is it unknown? Because there are no relevant fossil remnants, it is unknown. The discovery of well-preserved fossil remains serves as the cornerstone of any argument for identifying a direct ancestor of modern humans. The scientific study of human origins is built on these fossils, which are the visible remains of a distant past. Researchers from a variety of disciplines, including paleoanthropologists, geneticists, comparative anatomists, geologists, archaeologists, paleoenvironmentalists, and population-level analysts, methodically combine their findings to determine whether or not specific fossils they must begin by locating well-preserved fossils with distinctive physical characteristics. There can be no research if there are no fossils. Second, the presence of fossils makes it possible to determine whether Homo sapiens actually has genetic ties to other ancient DNA contained in the fossils. Third, they must carry out thorough anatomical investigations, establish precise dating, collect artifacts from the archaeological site, comprehend the prehistoric setting where the fossils were discovered, and collect fossilized evidence from a variety of sources. This entire effort can help establish a strong case for potential direct ancestors. However, without fossils, no studies and no conclusions can be made. What are the chances that these fossils will be found soon? Hypothetically, it is conceivable that there is a 1% to 5% chance that recently discovered fossil remains would be well preserved and represent a direct ancestor of Homo sapiens. Therefore, our story is unknown from a scientific standpoint. Mm. Slide 5. The religious imagination. The religious imagination is a distinctive way of thinking and feeling about things that are outside the scope of our common understanding. It functions as a creative force that aids in our understanding of religious and spiritual concepts. It is a realm filled with symbols and legends. People create stories to explain topics like how the world started or why we are here and use symbols to stand for significant religious ideas. Religious imagination also enables people to perceive spiritual realities that are invisible to the naked eye. It resembles gaining a unique understanding of the divine via practices like prayer or meditation. People use their religious imagination to express their beliefs and connect with the divine when they pray and carry out religious rites. Religious thoughts and feelings are frequently reflected in art, music, and other creative endeavors. These forms of expression can inspire strong feelings and help communicate religious messages. Religious imagination also is a component of cultures and society, not merely an individual quality. It shapes the way people live, what they believe, and how they relate to each other. People use their religious imagination to interpret and reinterpret their religious ideas over time. This helps them adapt to changes in the world and society. In simple terms, the religious imagination is like a creative power that helps us understand and connect with the spiritual and religious aspects of life. It is a way of thinking, feeling, and expressing what is important to us in the realm of the divine and sacred. In contrast with, religious imagination, directly knowing spiritual realities is instantaneous, 
transcends interpretation and the use of symbols, and results in experiences that can be transformative. For instance, directly encountering God and picturing God have quite different effects on daily life. It is impossible to directly know how, when, or where God created the earth and people. This is beyond comprehension or imagination. Nevertheless, the religious imagination permits the use of images, metaphors, concepts, and the imagination itself to glimpse the ineffable. The upcoming creation stories will therefore be a window into the inexplicable and a lesson in the workings of religious imagination. Enjoy! Slide 6. Creation Stories. Sumerian, Hebrew, Zulu, Hawaiian, Japanese, Iroquois. Slide 7. Slide 8. Slide 9. Slide 10. Slide 11. Slide 12. Slide 13. A newly found creation story. A translation of an Akkadian text into modern English. Slide 14. The beginning of creation. Before there was before, before anything was, there was no thing. Out of no thing appeared a void and things appeared in the void. <laughs> changed form and expanded as the void expanded. Okay. Sorry. It got away from me. That's all right. All right. So we did looked at religious right. imagination, scientific imagination, which they all, the only thing that said is that we humans evolve, but they can't explain how. So what they've done is they've found um, uh, fossils and then lined them up through time and then assume that there is some progress between them. And then they discovered, oh, no, it's not like that. It branches off. So somehow during that story, if we go back to the this beginning story here, and as you can see, you have a, a male and a female, and it, it starts off with chimpanzees. So we, we move along this evolutionary track from chimpanzees and to pre-hominids to a sort of, sort of like a human, and then finally humans. And that is the, that's, that is the only story. And so you, 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 you see this kind of picture has been used for decades mm -hmm. to illustrate that this is the order of, of the evolving status of human beings, but there's no evidence. No. All you have is little pictures along the way, but those pictures don't represent what actually happened. In order to say that th this human here came from a pre-circumstance, you have to have the fossil to demonstrate, and it has to be closely related and it has to demonstrate uh, why they need to look at the site and collect artifacts because there has to be evidence of intelligence of the kinds of things that homo sapiens can do. Now on the religious side, uh, there are these uh, fanciful ideas uh, where you have Michelangelo, uh, symbolically representing God creating Adam. And the title of this is The Creation of Adam. And, um, but it, did that happen like this? This is just an image. So people have now changed and they said, oh no, it, this needs to be corrected because we know that all human beings came from Africa. So the creator, had to really start with a black woman. Mm. And so, and therefore, if that black woman is made in the likeness and image of God, then God must be a black woman. So this artist uh, pretty much took the uh, Michelangelo's idea and uh, uh, changed the, the uh, anthropomorphic images. And down here, we have uh, God appearing as a human uh, being, uh, a, a humanoid of some sort, and he has the sleeping Adam there with the red hair, and then he creates uh, the woman out of the rib 
of Adam. And that's what this depicts. Now, did that happen? Mm -hmm. Was a woman created out of a man's rib? Or is it symbolic? And it's a way that in the Bible uh, and elsewhere, other creation stories are trying to understand something that is a total, absolute mystery. And the reason why it's a total, absolute mystery is because we were not there. We don't have any evidence. We don't have anything except these images to work with. So we go on next. In this part, you guys will have to contribute. Uh, which of these stories would you like to listen to? So I put in the Sumerian one and the Old Testament one since they are close in time. And then I added uh, a one from uh, a Zulu nation, Hawaiian version, a Japanese version, and a Native American. Of course, there are many, many more than this, but these are short uh, stories that you can look at and compare and to see if you don't like the Sumerian one because you favor the Old Testament one, are you prejudiced? Mm. Is, mm. Uh, which, one is, which one is more real? And you'll see that there are biases in all of these stories. And we don't even know who created most of these stories. But I'd like to hear Native American. Okay. And what other vote do we have? We got one for Native American. Let's hear the Zulu. Okay. One, one Zulu, one Native American. Any others? Going? <laughs> Quickly. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll go for the Sumerian. Sumerian. Okay. Next. Any other? I got three. Maybe that's I need to hear your voice. What did yes, you say? Yeah, I say I like to know about the Japanese. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Now, these stories are all produced by a single person. There are different people narrating. I check the background of the stories, and there's some slight changes, but all of these stories have changes. There are no creation stories that are singular and never change. They always have little changes. So this is just to give you the idea. So we'll go Sumerian, Zulu, Japanese, and Iroquois. Is that OK? Beautiful. OK, here we go. Before time began, there was only darkness and the goddess Namu, the primordial sea. She gave birth to Anki, the universe. At first, they were heaven and earth in one, a vast mountain of soil and sky mixed together. Anki produced Enlil, the air. Enlil separated his parents into An, the sky, and Ki, the mother earth. He pulled his mother down to form solid ground and pushed his father up to form the heavens. He then created the moon god Nana, who created the sun god Utu. Enlil and Ki, air and earth, joined to produce Enki, the god of water, vegetation and wisdom, and the lord of the universe. Enki gathered together part of the primordial sea and squeezed it into the rivers Tigris and Euphrates. He caused there to be cattle on the earth and fish in the rivers. He built marshland around the rivers and made the soil rich and fertile. Meanwhile, in heaven, the gods were having a large drunken banquet. They decided to create humans. The first race was made of clay in the weak in body and mind. At the time, everyone was too drunk to see how poorly they were made. The humans descended to live on Enki's earth. 
Before long, it became clear that this race had too many problems to survive and be a credit to the gods who created them. The gods decided to destroy them all in a great flood. Only two people were worthy enough to survive, a man named Ziusudra and his wife. Enki came to them with instructions. They were to build a wooden ark and hide there until the floodwaters subsided. The gods redirected the Tigris and Euphrates and caused a violent flood, washing all the humans to their deaths. The storms raged day and night until there was no dry land. Ziusudra and his wife were safe in their wooden ark. They wept at the loss of mankind. Finally, the rivers shrank back and the land around them re-emerged. Ziusudra and his wife began a new generation of men and women and set up their villages on the shores of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. Uh, first. Oh, we can see that now. Next is, um, oh, you should also pay attention to how women and men are treated in these um, creation stories, which is what we're talking about, her story, his story, and so on. Okay, next. Now, where is the next button here? Nope, here we go. Next is the Zulu in the order of presentation. Long ago, before man or any animals roamed the earth, there was just darkness and one very large seed. The seed sank into the earth, and from it, long reeds began to grow. They were called Uthlanga, which means the source of all things. Slowly, one reed grew into a man. It was Unkulunkulu, first man and the creator of all things. The larger he grew, the heavier he became. Finally, when he was fully grown, he broke off from the reed and fell to earth. As he strolled up and down the earth, he saw other growing reeds forming into men and women. Unkulunkulu broke off the first men and women, medicine men and their dreams. He pulled off cattle and fish and birds and fierce creatures. He created streams and mountains lakes and valleys, wind and rain, and the sun and the moon. Unkulunkulu created everything we see around us today. He taught the first men and women how to hunt and make fire, how to make clothes and prepare corn. He gave all the animals their names. When all of this was done, Unkulunkulu sent the languid chameleon out into the world with the message that his people will never die. The chameleon plodded on his mission, slowly, slowly, slowly. After several days, Unkulunkulu became impatient and sent a speedy lizard out into the world with the message that death was on its way. The swift lizard quickly overtook the chameleon and arrived at the village first. Once the lizard brought its message to the first people, Death arrived shortly thereafter. It has never left mankind since. Hmm. Person. Mm -hmm. oh. Oh, whatever you are. Okay. Next is um uh, Japanese? I think so, yeah. Yeah. By request. Yes, by request. As Dr. Lewis was sharing, please take notes of, of the man and woman symbolisms um, within this narratives. Thank 
Before there was heaven and earth, there was darkness. In the midst of this darkness was a swirling mass in the shape of an enormous egg containing all things. Slowly, over the course of many years, the lighter and purer part drew itself away from the heavier and denser part. The heavy material settled to form the earth. This was in yin. The lighter part rose to form the heavens. This was yo, yang. In and yo were opposites, just, um, but one could not exist without uh, the other. Yin is the feminine and yo is the masculine, and all things in the world have the properties of one of these two forces. Did you say something, Stoyan? No? From this separation, the first beings appeared. There were Izanagi, male who invites, and Izanami, female who invites. Izanagi and Izanami found themselves on the floating bridge of heaven and peered down into the darkness below. All they heard was the sound of rushing water. Is there no land beneath us? They asked each other. Izanagi thrust a jewel-tipped spear into the waters. As he drew it up again, the drips formed the island Onogorojima, which means spontaneously created island. The two gods descended to this island to live. Izanagi and Izanami decided to become husband and wife and build the land together. They agreed that each should walk in the opposite direction around the world axle, and when they met each other again, they would be married. So they set off to the south and north and walked for days and weeks and months. Finally, they met each other in the middle. Izanami was the first to speak. What a lovely man I have met, she exclaimed. But this distressed Izanagi, who felt that it should have been him, the man, to speak first. He declared this unlucky and determined that they would do this again. Thus, Izanagi and Izanami turned around and walked in opposite directions for days and weeks and months to meet again on the other side of the world axle. When they met again, it was Izanagi who spoke first. What a beautiful maiden I have met. Izanami explained that, as the in-force, there was a part of her body which was empty. Izanagi replied that, as the yo-force, there was a part of his body which was too much. Therefore, they completed each other and became one as husband and wife. Their first child was the island of Ahaji. They produced six more islands and declared it the great eight island country, Japan. Izanami gave birth to the sun goddess, who was so radiant that they sent her to rule in heaven and called her Ohohiro Menomuchi. Their next child was to be her consort, the moon. He was called Tsukiyumi no Mikoto and was sent to accompany the sun and rule in heaven at her side. Izanagi and Izanami produced many more children who became gods or elements. They were very happy together for many years. Izanami's last child was the god of fire. She was burned to death during his birth and was whisked away to Yomi, the underworld. In despair, Izanagi left all of their children and grew old and lonely on the far island of Tsukuji. Okay, and the last one from Why? Mr. Uh, Urban. Yeah. This is a famous uh, sky woman. This world was created. There was the sky world, high above the endless waters. In this sky world, there lived the sky caretaker and his wife, the sky woman. They lived in a lodge by the great tree of light, which illuminated their world through its brightly glowing flowers. 
One day, a great wind burst through the sky world and ripped the tree of light out of the ground. The light was gone, and all that remained was a vast hole. The sky woman accidentally fell through the hole. She fell for miles and miles and was about to plunge into the endless waters below when a fish hawk spotted her and caught her in his wings. The woman was too heavy for the hawk and he started sinking towards the waters. Luckily, a great sea turtle saw the pair faltering towards the water. He offered his back for the woman to live. But the woman needed earth under her feet, so she asked the animals of the endless waters for help. None of the other animals could dive deeper than the muskrat, so he was called on to swim down and find earth. The muskrat dove deep, deep, deep down into the endless waters. Finally, he touched soft mud. He scooped up as much as he could and returned to the surface. All the animals helped spread the earth onto the turtle's back. As the animals worked, the Sky Woman began to walk in counterclockwise circles around the turtle's back. As she walked, the turtle began to grow. The woman walked in larger and larger circles around the turtle's back, and the turtle grew and grew and grew. Finally, the turtle was the size of the earth we know today. Together, the Sky Woman and the animals built lakes and mountains and forests and vast plains. The woman had a daughter who became the Earth Mother. Earth Mother bore three daughters, corn, beans, and squash, and twin sons, the evil-minded Flint and the good-minded Sapling. The good son Sapling created the sun, the moon, plants, and other animals. He created all the pleasant things we have on earth. His evil brother Flint destroyed much of Sapling's work. He created what was unpleasant in the world we know. When Sapling created fish, Flint gave them hard bones. When Sapling created berry bushes, Flint gave the bushes thorns. When Sapling created summer, Flint made sure there was a winter. Sapling then created different kinds of humans. He filled their minds with good thoughts, but his brother made sure to give them evil thoughts too. From yellow bark, Sapling created the Asian race. From sea foam, he created the Caucasian race. He created Africans from dark clay. And from red clay, he created the Haudenosaunee or Iroquois people. But these different humans could not live together in the same place. They were constantly at war. Each race was then separated and put into each of the four corners of the world. The world is still carried by a giant sea turtle over the endless waters and the different races still make war to this day. Wow. Okay, now it is time to present a 15 minute or so uh, a newly found creation story. A translation of an Akkadian text into modern English. And here we go. Hope I can do this right. <laughs> You've been doing it right, Otto. A newly found creation story. The translation of an Akkadian text into modern English. Slide 14. The beginning of creation. Before there was before, before anything was, there was no thing. Out of no thing appeared a void and things appeared in the void. The things changed form and expanded as the void expanded, and the things were the void. The things clumped forming spirit, energy, space, time, matter, and all the things, unseen and seen. Then an infinitesimally small land seed appeared in time and space covered in water, ice, and non-living things. Living things, unseen and seen, of all kinds slowly appeared on its surface. Slide 15. The birth of Lysander and Alien. Two extraordinary beings emerged from the land seed. They were unlike any creatures that had come before, for they were suffused with the essence of creation. 
The first of these beings was Lysander, a figure of ethereal beauty whose skin shimmered with the hues of the setting sun, whose eyes held the wisdom of the ages, and whose heart radiated boundless love and compassion. Wherever Lysander walked, life blossomed, and peace followed. The second being was called Alien, a being of grace and harmony, whose skin was adorned with patterns like the flowing waters. Alien's fingers had the power to heal and nurture. Alien's mind was a tapestry of curiosity and wonder that sought to unravel the mysteries of the cosmos. One fateful day, as destiny weaved its intricate threads, Lysander and Alien found themselves drawn together in a mystical glade, bathed in the soft light of the moon. Their gazes met, and in that timeless moment, the universe itself held its breath. A profound connection sparked between them, one that transcended the boundaries of the physical world. In the heart of that enchanted grove, they gave birth to two extraordinary beings, Alara and Thalos. Slide 16. The Celestial Union. One fateful day, as destiny weaved its intricate threads, Lysander and Alien found themselves drawn together in a mystical glade, bathed in the soft light of the moon. Their gazes met, and in that timeless moment, the universe itself held its breath. A profound connection sparked between them, one that transcended the boundaries of the physical world. In the heart of that enchanted grove, they gave birth to two extraordinary beings, Alara and Thalos. Slide 17. Alara and Talu's Quest. Alara was born with the spirit of intellect. Alara's mind was a beacon of light in the gloom of ignorance. Alara possessed the gift of reason with thought that soared to the celestial realms. Alara's heart's deepest longing was to uncover the secrets of the cosmos and to understand the purpose of existence. Thalos, born with the spirit of emotion, was a wellspring of passion and union. Thalos felt the world's heart and joys. Talu's deepest desire was to connect with the heartbeat of the cosmos and unlock the ancient wisdom it held. As Alara and Thalos opened their eyes to the world, they beheld their creators with reverence and gratitude. Lysander and Alien, their celestial parents, bestowed upon them the knowledge that they were born not merely of flesh and bone, but also of the essence of the creation. Mm. Days turned into seasons into years, and Alara and Thalos ventured forth into the wondrous world around them, driven by a thirst for knowledge and an unbounded capacity for union with all things. They discovered the mysteries of the forests, the melodies of the rivers, and the whispers of the mountains. Slide 18. Alara and Thalos turn inward. Yet, within the depths of their souls, the yearning took root to delve deeper into the physical and material aspects of existence. And as their bodies physically grew and changed, they experienced mood swings, irritability, and emotional oversensitivity. They experienced intense emotions, thoughts, and desires they had not encountered before. They became bewildered and overwhelmed. Their natural curiosity gave way to fascination and fascination to obsession with themselves. Alara turned her intellect inward, seeking to understand the desires of the self, while Thalos turned inward and was enraptured by the intense emotions coming from an increasing focus on physicality. As they delved further into the labyrinth of their own desires, they became entrapped in the illusions of the material realm. They grew self-centered and detached from the harmony of the cosmos that had once guided them. Their connection to the celestial was obscured by the shadows of their self-indulgence. In their self-imposed isolation, Alara and Thalos lost sight of the profound purpose that had brought them into being, the quest for knowledge and union. As they turned inward, their spirits were dulled by the attachment to physicality and material existence. Slide 19. Alara and Thalos become clouded. As Alara and Thalos became more absorbed with themselves, their spirits grew dim, and a shadow of sadness and bewilderment descended upon them. They became ensnared in the desires of their physical bodies and the allure of the material world. Their once celestial connection had become clouded, and they began wandering in daily life in search of meaning. In their pursuit of material pleasures, Alara and Thalos lived separate lives, each consumed by their own desires. Alara, driven by the relentless quest for knowledge, spent great amounts of time thinking and delving deeper into psychological states that delivered no satisfaction. She acquired knowledge of the world that had little use. She felt empty. Thalos, on the other hand, was drawn to the sensory delights of the world. He reveled in the beauty of nature, the arts, and the emotions of those around him. He only found fleeting happiness in the moments of connection he shared with others. Thalos also was empty inside. Yet, despite their individual pursuits, a deep emptiness persisted within them. They yearned for something more, 
a sense of purpose that had once burned brightly in their souls. The memory of their celestial origin, of Lysander and aliens' love and wisdom, haunted their memories. Slide 20. The Union of Alara and Thalos. In time, the universe, in its infinite wisdom, granted them a second chance to rekindle their connection and rediscover their cosmic purpose. Alara and Thalos, drawn together by an invisible thread of fate, found themselves face to face once more. In the presence of each other, they felt a spark reigniting within their souls, a spark of recognition and longing. The cosmic spirits of Lysander and Alien whispered to them, reminding them of their shared destiny. With newfound determination, Alara and Thalos embarked on a shared journey, seeking not only knowledge and sensory experiences, but also the deeper mysteries of existence. They explored the union of their intellect, emotion, and will recognizing that true enlightenment lay at the union of heart, mind, and body. As they delved deeper into their shared quest, their bond deepened, and their love flourished. And, as a testament to the reawakening of their celestial spirits, they were blessed with three remarkable children, Astra, Orion, and Selene. Astra, their firstborn, embodied the brilliance of the cosmos. She possessed a thirst for knowledge that rivaled the brightest stars in the night sky. Orion, their second child, was a beacon of strength and compassion. He possessed a deep understanding of the human heart and sought to heal the wounds of the world. Selene, the youngest, was a muse of creativity and harmony. She reveled in the beauty of nature and the arts, and her melodies could touch the very soul. Through their children, Alara and Thalos rediscovered the true essence of their cosmic origins, the union of mind and body, the quest for knowledge and understanding, and the boundless capacity for union in love. Slide 21. A thousand years of turmoil. Yet, the inward turning that had ensnared Alara and Thalos proved to be a formidable shadow, lurking in the depths of their family's lineage. Despite the love and wisdom they shared with their children, the temptation of the material world and the desires of the physical body remained a constant presence. With each passing generation, the children inherited not only the gifts of their celestial lineage, but also the inner struggle that had plagued their ancestors. As the generations passed, the family's once bright legacy began to fade. The inward turning left them stranded in a world of ignorance and confusion. The stories of Alara and Thalos, of love and cosmic purpose, became distant echoes in their collective memory. The celestial spirits of Lysander and Alien whispered to the hearts of their descendants, urging them to seek the path of balance and connection once more. In the despair and confusion, there remained a hope that one day, a chosen soul from their lineage would heed the call of the cosmos, rekindle the light of purpose, and guide their family back to the path of enlightenment. As the population increased, the gloom deepened, and the world became increasingly populated by people consumed by their individual desires and obsessions with themselves. After forty generations, there came one from their lineage who was able to reverse the inward turning and put the world back on its course toward union and light. Slide 22. This chosen soul, known as Lyra, emerged at a time when the world teetered on the brink of spiritual despondency. She was born with a profound awareness of her cosmic lineage, carrying within her the wisdom of the ages that had been passed down through the generations. From an early age, Lyra felt the weight of her ancestors' struggles and the responsibility to restore balance and light to the world. Lyra possessed a unique gift, the ability to see beyond the surface of material desires and into the depths of the human soul. She understood that the inward turning was a consequence of disconnection from the cosmic source that bound all life together. She taught that true union could only be achieved by transcending the ego and recognizing the interconnectedness of all beings. Slowly but steadily, a community of like-minded souls began to form around her, drawn by the promise of a higher purpose. Through their collective efforts, they began to reverse the inward turning that had plagued generations. As the community of enlightened souls grew, their influence expanded beyond the confines of their immediate circle. Their teachings and actions inspired others to re-evaluate their priorities and embrace a deeper connection with the universe. The world slowly began to shift from a place of self-obsession to one of collective awakening. Lyra, the Chosen One. Slide 23. The Family Union. Lyra's journey of enlightenment and her efforts to counter the prevailing gloom did not unfold in isolation. She was joined on her path by a kindred spirit, her husband named Aurisus, who shared her vision of restoring balance and light to the world. Together, they forged a profound union that would become a guiding light for generations to come. Aurisus, like Lyra, possessed a deep well of compassion and wisdom. 
he had long yearned for a purpose greater than the pursuit of material desires. His heart resonated with Lyra's teachings, and their union was one of cosmic significance. From their union, Lyra and Orisis bore three extraordinary children, Celestia, Solon, and Luna. Each child inherited a unique blend of their parents' celestial gifts, and together, they formed a celestial family united in their mission to spread the light of enlightenment throughout the world. As a family, they embarked on a remarkable journey, traveling across the world to share their teachings and insights with diverse cultures and communities. Slide 24. A Celestial Family. Their celestial family of union became a source of inspiration and hope for people from all walks of life. Together, they founded a community of like-minded souls who gathered to learn, grow, and rediscover their cosmic connection. Through the guidance of Lyra, Orisis, Celestia, Solon, and Luna, the Celestial Fellowship expanded its reach, spreading its message of unity and enlightenment throughout the world. They taught that true fulfillment could only be found in the harmonious union of intellect, emotion, and spirit, transcending the confines of the ego. However, despite their best efforts and the guiding light they provided, the vast majority of humankind remained ensnared by the relentless inward turning. The consequences of this incapacity were profound. A pervasive confusion and dysfunction gripped the world, casting a shadow of unhappiness and despair over the lives of most. The human spirit, despite its continuous longing and tireless search for an ideal interior state and world, remained trapped in a cycle of material desires and ego-driven pursuits. In the pursuit of individual desires, relationships suffered, families fractured, and communities splintered. The interconnectedness that had once bound humanity together was fraying, replaced by a sense of isolation and disconnection. Loneliness became a pervasive ailment of the human condition, as hearts closed off to one another. The world's natural beauty, once a source of wonder and inspiration, was often overlooked or exploited. When the inward turning yields to a brighter dawn of enlightenment, the collective longing for an ideal interior state and ideal world will be fulfilled. The human spirit will shine with the brilliance of its cosmic origins. This is where we are today. Beautiful. Wow, wow, that is beautiful. Beautiful. Dr. Harry, my God. Thank you, thank you. Wow, that's a lot of. Hey, Dr. Lewis. Um, Dr. Lewis, sorry. I know there's, 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 there will be um, um, maybe questions and commentary. Uh, we are at eleven forty. As we had noted, this would be an ongoing um, unveiling um, that is so needed. I really thank you, Dr. We, we cannot, I cannot say enough about the hours and the time and the way you've presented this um, session to allow us um, really revisit um, and get some more insights as to how we can solve our root problem to recognize God in us. The universe as in God is granting us another opportunity to truly reconnect to the original, very good, the original parenting heart that is already in us and around us. I pray we can, that last um, 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 presentation, um, just so in line with at least where I am and this understanding of a chosen person, I pray we can all uh, rise up to understand Lyra, Jesus, Father Moon, yourself also as a chosen person, Pastor Simon, yourself, Wagas, yourself, Dr. Lily, yourself, um, Richard, yourself, Mrs. By, yourself, Nanji. You are a chosen person. You are. So I thank you. We are going to just have anybody who has, um, you know, I, would, I want Dr. Stunyan because we are looking at um, really not just um, um, revealing these, these things or engaging this dialogue, but how we really um, embody the original true parental heart of, of creation. You want to call God whatever I name you, that's fine. That God is not, God has no problem. Believe me. I want to tell somebody who is still dogma. Oh, you know, you must call God. No, no, God. So just want to open up for, for Dr. Stunian in particular. Um, 
how can these narratives, this 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 revisiting, um, I pray it can help us, um, help other so-called believers, believers, believers. I um, know that. Um, yes, we thank God for the Bible. Just Christians thank God for the Bible. The Jews thank God for the Bible. The, the, the Muslims thank God for the Quran. The, the, the Hindus thank God for the Upanishad. And the Upanishad, like many of all these other stories, are older than the biblical narrative to an extent. And we can see how some of these stories really help us see man and woman, and especially the woman. Um, in a more motherly birthing role, emerging. Um, role. So, Dr. Stunyan, I wonder if you have any comments to share before we 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 um, round up today. Um, I hope this has been helpful to everyone, um, to humble, especially us brothers, to know that um, God needs the yin and the yang together, not just the patriarchy. Mindset of um, muscle, external domination, but that internal um, heart that sometimes is, is in, in the patriarchy um, um, delivery of our story. Uh, please, I say a lot, but if you listen very well to everything said today, I find solution in revisiting our origin. I find solution that I see our story is not um, in a box that this is it, but that the universe is still unfolding to help us see the root of yin yang, the root of male and female, the harmonious union of masculinity and femininity, not the man wanting to think he is a subject and has led us to where we are. Unfortunately, this is the truth. Um, we have had a patriarchy dominant world, and I must re-examine that as a man, as a patriarch, in some extent, um, why has patriarchy led us this way? Is it because we didn't tell our story very well? We didn't allow the matriarch to also emerge and, 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 and let her heart, her wisdom, as she's all, always known throughout the world, brothers and sisters, in theological circles, that wisdom is looked at as a woman. She, they always call her she, wisdom. So I pray her wisdom will give birth to um, this work we are fight, not fighting, this ability to love the world into correction, to love um, our communities, the school board, the president, to love people and show them that true parental original heart of God that wants all of us, not some of us. I know God wants you. I know God needs you. I know for fact. I know that for fact. And God is using you where you are. Let us hear some, just a few words, reflection on what you've received today. Thank you. Uh, very, very kind of you. And uh, thank you, Dr. Lewis, for um, uh, really fascinating and engaging uh, overview of the many efforts we have made to make sense of our beginnings. All inadequate, uh, but all I think hold some elements of truth. We just don't know what is sweet and what is chaff. <laughs> so we need more winnowing <laughs> yes. so we can sort it through properly. Um, you know, the original statement that was made, uh, I believe by uh, Mother Bayou, um, we said, without mothers, there would be no others. But actually, we should say, without mothers and fathers, there would be no others. Uh, you know, we need to be more inclusive. <laughs> yes, that's a shock first to, to let you all know that fathers don't dominate. <laughs> and that's why the two become one. There you go. <laughs> I, I think I, I told you... Um, the, the famous uh, question that was uh, posed. Um, I don't know if I shared with you before. If I have, I apologize. But in this context, I think uh, it, it added more light. The question is, how can you tell when a man is about to say something that you know is going to be absolutely brilliant and you know it'll be brilliant before he says it? How do you know that? Remember that? I think I do. <laughs> yeah. It's whenever he starts his sentence by saying, my wife told me, 
I like. I know what's coming next. It's gonna be brilliant. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know yeah, that's what it is. That my wife told me. Yeah, yeah, I remember. That. <laughs> that's it also sounds like a cop out when, 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 when you don't want to carry carry the name of something. Oh, my wife. So, <laughs> so I'm I'm using this story to give myself an excuse. I hear you. <laughs> I didn't check with my wife, so I don't know to tell you all the wisdom, okay? <laughs> so I can only give you a little bit. <laughs> that way I have a, a, a story narrative for an excuse, okay? <laughs> anyway, um, you know, the question is, how do we recover the origins of our being? And um, we need to understand, first of all, the beginning point is to understand that the creation story is older than our faith founding. You know, many times when I meet with people of faith, they say, well, the beginning is with Muhammad. We need to go back to Muhammad and all will be well. Go back to Jesus and all be well. Go back to Moses and all be well. Go back to whatever, you know, go back to Buddha and all will be well. Uh, I'm afraid not. You see, we need to dig more into the past because the beginning is before these individuals picked up on the key elements. Yes, so I think the question is not to understand a creation story in terms of uh, limited scientific uh, capability because by virtue of its parameters, it can only answer with ontological proof, actual proof, you know, actual uh, evidence. And we don't have it, so they're limited. And then we have the story narratives but I think uh, uh, we need to understand creation in terms of principles. And the reason principles are so amazing to me is because they never, ever change. Principles are constants. And once we understand something in principle, there is no limit to how much application we can make of these same principles and create new things to come into being. So we don't understand our origin in principle. We don't understand our relationships in principle. We don't understand myself in principle. We don't understand anything in such a way. Uh, we mostly spend time copying. Uh, we see others uh, doing something and then we copy that, uh, which, you know, which is the beginning point of learning. You know, when you smile at a baby, they're not smiling back. They're copying your face. Mm -hmm. sure. <laughs> they don't understand what smiling is. Yes, okay. Oh, yeah. Great. So I left it on. Uh, so the question is how do we come to understand uh, creation in principle and then apply these principles in ever greater ways? You know, the principles of flight uh, have been in effect for billions of years. Bugs flew, uh, okay. birds flew for okay. a long, long time. And even though we watched them and watched how they do it, we never understood how to do it until we understood their flight in principle. We couldn't go out there and jump off uh, a building or a cliff and, you know, pretend to be an eagle, put some feathers on. It didn't work. But once we understood the principle of flight, we could fly. Yes, and because we understood principles of flight beyond simply imitating uh, the first uh, flight uh, on a Kitty Hawk, that's why we could build a 747. Otherwise, we'd still be flying uh, the Kitty Hawks because all we could do is copy what we saw. But once we understood flight in principle, we could do many things. So I think the question is, can we understand love in principle? And uh, once we understand love in principle, then we can apply it in infinite ways and create infinite beauty uh, to come rather than just copy. And uh, I'll leave you with this. It's my conclusion that God creates each of us as one of a kind beings. And our primary task is to bring to life the image that God had sown in each of us. You are your only competition. There will never be another one like you. 
There isn't another one like you. There was a never, never another one like you. You're one of a kind of creation. Each of us are one of a kind of creation. If we can understand that and bring that to life, we can stop being Elvis lookalikes. Because, you know, if you're trying to be an Elvis lookalike, even if you look better than Elvis, if you sound better than Elvis, move better than Elvis, you're still a lookalike. <laughs> you're fake. <laughs> God, we are not look alike here. When I look around, we see only the likeness of the divine, the creators. Thank you, Dr. Stunyan. You always, always stimulate um, the essence. And no doubt, when we listen to all the stories, all the narratives about creation, it's very clear that there's that principle running through. The principle of the harmonious union of femininity and masculinity it runs through the whole. And so the more we can bring that to life, as you noted, um, this is this is this is where um, patriarchy must help and bring in the uh, younger the year, which one is male, which one is female. The man has been too much lopsided. So we thank God for great humble sons of God. Dr. Burgess, thank you so much. For this collaborative us giving that is happening. Stunia, thank you. But, uh, Richard, thank you. Uh, Richard, last week, again, um, continuing to press on um, the great work of Union Station. Again, that, that principle of man and woman, complementary opposite at the core of the universe. How do we display it beautifully, harmoniously? And we know, no doubt, must start at home. Anytime I see the Urbans together. That does not mean Dr. Stunyan does not, his wife is not there. That does not mean my wife is not here. That does not mean other. What we are really saying is I love that 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 this 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 window and that sacred window when I see uh, a man and a woman together. But even when I don't see that on the screen, I see it in in in, in the way our brothers speak. You see, you can see. That's why Jesus can say, when you see Jesus, you see God. You see that principle already. And that's why we use the word stay here. We must see that principle in each other. Because that principle is still in you as an individual. As a man, Father Bio, your mother is in you, whether you like it or not. Every one of us as men, our mothers are in us. And so, how do we help everyone to activate their blessedness beyond again? Boxing God in that only the way the Bible talks about the creation, that's it. And you were not there. I was not there. Really want to encourage this because this, this dogmatism, the way a person my own religion or my interpretation of the beginning is the only that becomes the problem also in how we look at ourselves. I am the only one God loves. The other people God don't love. Because I think, or I've been cajoled to believe that the way my people, the Uruguayans tell the, the story, the way the Japanese tell the story, the way they quickly tell the story of is, is the only way, only. No, it's not. It's not. The principle, as Dr. Stringer has put it forward, is what unites us. And it's clear. It is very clear. So the prayer again, the prayer again is it's to echo. Men, please lift up the truth about the missing voices of the feminine. She was there in the beginning. Mm -hmm. The Bible is too patriarchal. It, it really, 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 and that is what has been put into the world. And that's not the balance. That's not the principle. So I'm so. Uh, Father Bayo, I know. Uh, thank you so much, and everybody, Dr. Stunya, even our presenter. May the Lord bless you all. You know, I'm not just listening to all the slides and everything being spoken. Do you know what is actually just so honest in this uh, uh, slide? It's yes, always a second chance. A second chance. Because you see when the Japanese man says it's the man that's supposed to speak to a woman, they go going back here and do it again. You yes. know, I mean, at the end of the celestial of the last uh, slide, yes. always a second chance. God always gives us a second chance to go and then reclaim yourself and come back and I will take you for who you are. That's my conclusion. Thank you again for re-echoing the universe as in God 
is granting us again another opportunity as my sister yes. a chance to truly reconnect to the original very good principle of yin yang or masculinity and femininity working in divine union now if we we have to stay with that that's why we are what we do by our heavenly couples that's why we are heavenly couples not man and man only only men telling the story about men and women brothers and sisters so let us continue tomorrow on sunday um um for all those who are still here um we we will send out a, a link that you can help join dr richard maybe um this may be fit for you as we all not just for you for everyone and um, dr stringer will be um is facilitating um another wonderful working group um, that is seeking again to help um pastors in particular or faith the faith community to revisit again the origin of parenting so that we can um help stem the tide of 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 this um godless or loveless not true love of this principle less no principle um um curriculars that are uh kind of um I'm taking over the schools and not just the schools everywhere. So um Dr. Stunian um is going to is inviting us 12:35 tomorrow um to be a part of that presentation. So do your best when you receive the link to join um and again to show even if you're not going to share let your heart be there um in support so that um we create that critical mass needed um, to love um only by or is there anything i'm missing i i know we can all of us will love to stay here uh, i just love I, i don't know how to say thank you i and i don't want to just say thank you i want to walk with you and as you see we are trying our best um please do your part as you are doing your part go back to the core of of the reality of why we are here it is man and woman let your forums let your churches wherever you doing seek seek to as a man and seek to highlight the voices of your sisters seek to highlight the voices of 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 the divine feminine it has not been told properly why am i saying that i know today other than people who are prominent you know Oprah Winfrey people know her story a little bit Rosa Parks people know her story a little bit But you know I like to know Stuyan's mother's story because that's a great mother. A mother who gave I like to know the story uh, of Louis Bridges' mother. I, I, I would people who want to know my mother's story. These hidden stories can move others more than just the Rosa Parks stories which sometimes is so far to read the Jesus story so far as Dr 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 Levi put it so beautiful. Jesus was not the only one who died young women women lost their children many they said jerusalem was crying their stories need to be told their stories yeah their, their pain and so we really are god is saying not only god is not looking for only one person's story god is looking what doctor bridges won't you want to hear from all your children if they come around you today hey, tell me what's going on how is your life you don't want to just hear from one child we want to hear from one another and we get encouraged we get more encouraged by the simple story of the good samaritan I don't know his name i don't i never met him. that story amazing and so this is what stories do that help set the the tone the stage especially our orig- our story of origin that we know it's a mystical and in a way mythical but more mystical and it has principle in the beginning and that principle is heavenly coupling heavenly coupling heavenly clumping heavenly loving heavenly gathering coming together into oneness with our unique uniqueness thank you dr bobis any last words so we close let's close it's 12 o'clock at the at the noon day um you 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 just put so much to this and i i please close us out on mute with any last words 
so that we can continue go clumping. Well, let's continue. Yeah. Yes, let's continue. Wednesday, Tuesday, I will send again. We'll send Sunday, 12 40 something. Tuesday is an evening gathering from seven. And uh, with us, Dr. Senior, myself, and other theologians, um, really getting at the heart of this, really being free now, responsible to share more. And then Wednesday with Dr. Levi, 8 p.m. All this now will be resent out for October and then Friday with the tardings. And then we are back here on Saturday. And we may have a new time or we may not, but we'll be back here consistently clumping together. Richard, thank you. Continue with your great work on Union Station. Mommy Stacy, thank you for being a great, great true daughter of God. Stacy, love you so much. Really do. Uh, Bishop Wagas, bless God for you, one in Christ. I know it's night there, about 9.30, 10 p.m., and you're here with us, and you're going to wake up tomorrow morning with more zest, more anointing, to keep sharing the truth. The brother, Pastor Jibit, you are, I believe now you, you travel to Sri Lanka for your conference, and we bless God for you, brother Jibit, in, in India, who is now attending a conference in Sri Lanka. We pray that um, the principle, the original parented heart of the universe of God will continue to allow us to love as Jesus loves. Jesus did not come to condemn. He came to show us how to love one another in the right way of the right principle. I love you so much. Let's continue clumping. Namaste. 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 Bless us all. Thank you. Thank you. Say hello to, Tati, to, to Lily. Lily. Hope yes. to see you all tomorrow. God bless you. Bye bye. Thank you for all your work. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Beautiful. Beautiful. Bless you, GB. See you all tomorrow. Dr. GB, stay. Ta da.